It's always nice to have you. You know, it's our neighborhood, our community, and our neighbors. So today, um, I have a really interesting guest, and I have to tell you that when I invited Patrick Dobson, he wrote a book. And the book is Seldom Seen, A Journey into the Great Plains. And I thought to myself, you know, I'm always looking for interesting people to introduce you to. And I thought to myself, this is the last thing in God's green earth that I would do. <laughs> <laughs> so I thought, well, he would be a most interesting guest for you to meet and for me to ask and talk to about his travels. But first, I'd like for you to meet Patrick Dobson. And Thank second, you. I need you to know that he is an author, he's a former journalist, and he has in his past been a working member of the Iron Workers Union Number no. 10 in Kansas City, and he has just gotten newly minted <laughs> his doctorate from UMKC in environmental history and American literature. So you've made a few changes in your life, Patrick Dobson. Uh, it seems that I, <laughs> I was just talking to somebody and. Uh, uh, the longest thing that I've ever done in my life is be married. Uh, <laughs> I haven't, uh, I haven't held a job for more than three years, except here and at Johnson County. Tell me how County. long she's got left. <laughs> <laughs> she's got 19 of them so oh. far, so we'll see so what happens. So well, we're doing okay. So yeah, <laughs> yeah. Uh, and then here at Johnson County, I've been here since 2009. Well, that's a good place for yeah. you to be because well, you. you can write uh, more. I hope you will. Yes, I do. Because this is really an interesting book. Although I don't want to do what he did, it's a, a really an interesting book. So I, I need to start, and I think we need to start talking about this trip that you took, and uh -huh. that's what the book's all about. And it ended up as a book, and he decided that his life was not um, what he wanted it to be, and that he was going to Helena, Montana. Why Helena, Montana? Well, I, uh, <coughs> I um, to tell the, the whole story, that day uh, when I decided this, I uh, was at work, and it just seemed to me that I'd gotten into this routine of getting up, going to work, coming home, getting up, going to work, coming home, and life had really closed in on me. And I was a single dad, I was very frightened, I was <laughs> broke all the time, and I thought to myself that I needed to do something to uh, make life different. And, um, and you know, I was working and uh, I was not paying very much attention to what I was doing, I was distracted and tired again, and one of the things that I had to do uh, was every three weeks paint the floor of the engineering department at what was then the Ritz-Carlton Hotel. Mm -hmm. And uh, again, like I said, I was distracted. I wasn't paying attention. And I painted myself into the middle of the floor. It was just like a gag from a movie. <laughs> and uh, a thunderstorm set down at that moment. Uh, and there was a door open to the plaza, and I smelled the rain, and really reminded me <laughs> of, of that those big spaces. Um, I had gone to the University of Wyoming to get my graduate degree. I took a class there <coughs> in the summer. Oh, really? Yeah, uh, I lived in the science, I'm an old science teacher. I lived in, they have a science camp in the Medicine Bow Mountains. Oh, now yeah, I it's a brilliant place. It's a brilliant and place. And rumbled along all summer looking for flowers. Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. And so uh, driving back and forth to, 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 uh, to uh, Laramie, um, you know, I had made that trip in two years 23 times mm -hmm. because I had a young daughter at home. And, and uh, so anyway, I'm, this thunderstorm sets down and I just, felt this moment of despair and suddenly decided that I was going to walk through the Great Plains to uh, somewhere on the other side. I, I got out a map later and decided on well, Helena, Montana. Let me tell you what he said in his book. <coughs> I'm going to quote you. And you said, my worth as a human being lies in endless files of pay stubs and records and taxes paid. Others were responsible for my misery. Sydney, that's his daughter, and her mother, my parents, my bosses, the companies, the utility company, the landlord. You had a whole, a whole litany of people. And then you said, I had to act before getting so accustomed to gloom that I would never escape. That's right. That's exactly right. That's what you said. And, you know, those, that list of people in the end, you know, I could make all the excuses that I wanted to. But I had to take some control of my life at that point. And I couldn't blame... Did 
somebody else uh, a, you know, that I owed money to or needed to pay rent or whatever it was. I had to do something well, different. And although it took you a couple of false starts to get started. That's right. <laughs> you set out, he set out with a backpack. His entire possessions were in that backpack and no gun. No gun. No. Somebody asked him, oh, well, aren't you going to take a gun? And, and I said, <laughs> I really want to meet people. I don't want to shoot them. <laughs> and then you stepped out into the world unknown. And you were going only so far as your Uncle Phil's house. Well, that's right. That's <laughs> so right. it wasn't that you were <clears throat> going to dive off a cliff the first day. No, he, Phil lived about uh, 15 miles away. And uh, that first day I walked out and I was very confident and uh, I think I made it about five or six miles and my confidence evaporated and I got scared. <laughs> and I, I was milling around on the suburban sidewalk and I was sure everybody saw me and became very self-conscious and so I went home and uh, decided I'd start the next day instead. Which you did. Which I did. Which you yes. did. Patrick is, um, I found this book um, kind of good food for the soul because oh, Patrick likes to, uh, he's very descriptive, he loves adjectives. And so he, um, words, phrases, he says, he called his tent a confused bundle of ropes and pole. And that was, <laughs> and I'm sure that's the first night you put it up, it was a confused bundle that's of right. ropes and a pole. And he then he talks about the sky and he calls it a, a, a clear star addled sky. Uh -huh. I thought that was really pretty. And he describes the prairie, and he says, the gray-blue dark of thunderstorm, a blanket of wheat or sunflowers and the smell of dust and dry grass renewed my spirit and allowed me to imagine new possibilities when I returned to the working life. See? Yeah, that's... Uh, you wrote that, Patrick. Yes, I did, and, <laughs> and that's... Uh, uh, I didn't realize it, of course. This is something you look back on. Uh, but that's exactly what happened. Uh, I did come back and life... Got better. It, it became mine. That's right. It became mine. And it's mine. important to become yours. Mm -hmm. Well, I want to know what you were... At, you know, when you stepped out that door, that was stepping off the cliff. Uh -huh. And he was walking too, by the by. And um, I'm thinking, wh what were you thinking? What, what was going through your head as you started off uh, really, the next day, what, what was going through your mind? What were you thinking? Well, um, <clears throat> I was frightened, and uh, and it would be a long time before I got up in the morning and walked out without being frightened. Uh, there was all that uncertainty. I mean, I knew I was going to stay at my Uncle Phil's house that first night, but then after that, where was I going to stay? What was I going to do? And I woke up. He had up no with notion my, of where he was going, what he was going to eat. I had a eat. general direction. Um, oh, but that was, uh, that's about as much as I'd actually planned. Uh, uh, that's scary. Thing. That is scary. What you said was, I see I'm catching him with his own there words. There you go. He said, I wanted to release myself from the past and the future. Uh huh. If, if I can, you know, one of, one of my greatest difficulties is just being present. And uh, if I'm trying to live in a moment, the moment presupposes a past and a future. Um, but if I lose a past and a future, then I'm living exactly as I should. I, I'm not thinking about what I did yesterday or what I'm going to do tomorrow. I'm doing what's right in front of me. I'm completely present. And, that's and to goal. you, that was very important. <clears throat> it is very important to me today, as a matter of fact. Well, and to some, it's not. They want to know what they're, you know, they work toward a future. So mm. that, that, that highlights the differences in people, which is a segue, I think, into the fact that on the way you looked and you saw things and you learned and you met a lot of interesting people. They were fantastic. And, and you know, the few, the, the, to write a book, you have to really make choices in how you're going to uh, advance the story. And so there's a lot more people uh, who aren't in the book than are in the book. Um, so well, I'm I sure to, that's true, because yeah. you couldn't write it. Well, you can write another book. <coughs> I, I mean, I, that's, that's a simple solution. Yeah. I don't charge for those suggestions. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. 
The first person that you met that I think is kind of interesting is Mike. And Mike says, well, he says, I think people's pretty much afraid about anything to avoid getting into what they think is prickly. But he says, I found once I get into situations I'm afraid of, none of them are nearly as bad as I thought they were going to uh, be. That is so true. I, and I'll tell you a quick story. I um, published my first book of poetry uh, this past week. Mm -hmm. And oh, we'll have to do this again. Uh, uh, well, yeah, that'd be great. I'd love to come back. <laughs> we could just spend uh, the rest of our lives chit-chatting about your, <laughs> probably. your writing efforts. <laughs> um, but I was sort of pacing around, and, and I found myself nervous and whatever. And a friend of mine asked, he says, are you doing okay? And I said, you know, once this thing starts, it'll be fine. And that's how it always Stepping is. out that door. That's right. That's it's how it always is. It's hard to step out that door. But I think Mike said it pretty well. Mm -hmm. That's right. That's right. Talk about him a little bit. He was kind of an interesting guy. Uh, this is Mike, I think, in, in um, uh, Cairo, Kansas. Uh -huh. Yeah. Um, Mike uh, came out of his house. I was sitting at the street sign, uh, just having a glass of water, and he came out. <coughs> and we had some chat outside of his house, and then he invited me in to look over maps uh, and things. And, uh, and he was sort of... I can almost see in his eyes that he was reliving parts of the road that I wanted to walk the next few days. Uh, and you could really see it he, in didn't his he eyes. Wasn't he the one that told you he'd kind of done that? Yes, he yes. had. Uh -huh. um, he, uh, he basically what he said is that uh, you know, he had a car that wasn't very reliable. <laughs> and so he frequently found himself walking some distance uh, mm -hmm. into Topeka or farther into uh, Silver Lake. Uh, to get his get his work done, but he said he liked it walking on the road, and he thought that it was really fantastic that I was out there doing that. Snakes out there too, you know, <coughs> on the road. Well, you know, I never ran into a snake. Well, you're good, but they're out on the road. They're out there. <laughs> they are. I, on this particular trip, though, I, that was I, the first thing I thought of when you when I knew what you had done. I thought, oh my heavens, there's snakes out on that. Road. <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I never ran into one. I, I guess I. I I, I sort of expected that I would run into a snake at one point or another, but never, not, not the whole way in. I think that it's important <coughs> to talk a little bit about your experience at St. Mary's because yes. that was not all positive. No, it was actually kind of terrible. Uh, and um, I walked into St. Mary's. Mm -hmm. uh, I had uh, about reached what I thought would be the end of my day. And... Uh, People in, in St. Mary's uh, weren't very friendly. Uh, as a matter of fact, I can almost say that I got run out of town uh, when I started asking about if I could stay in the park that night. Um, uh, most towns that I walked through, I would find the cop and tell the cop what I was doing and stay in the park. And most places were, were good with that. But St. Mary's was uh, very different. And um, I called the St. Mary's Academy <coughs> to see if they had like their dorm room because sometimes colleges will rent dorm rooms to people overnight and I didn't realize that it wasn't that kind of a college uh, and when I made that call that's when things got really uh, really sticky um, and finally a guy showed up uh, and he basically said get in the car and he he did some praying along the way, which made me kind of nervous because he seemed like he was a little extreme on this stuff. Uh, I was ready to jump out of the car at one point um, because I have no idea what... No, you didn't. What, what goes through these people's minds. But I think the <coughs> point here is <coughs> that in the book, everything isn't uh, coming up roses always. No, no. And everybody isn't wonderful. Mm -hmm. And everybody doesn't isn't genetically geared to help thy neighbor right? and to be kind. So I think that um, you learned a lesson in St. Mary's that was uh, an important one. Yes, and um, <coughs> one of the things that I, I learned and um, right away was to trust my instincts. Uh, I should have known from the way I was feeling when I walked into St. Mary's that that was not, not the, the place for me. The vibes weren't the very right. best there. And uh, when I got out of that guy's <laughs> car in Wamego, 
uh, I felt a great deal of relief. I uh, walked into the st to the convenience store there, which is m in many of these towns, the convenience store is a gathering place yeah, for people. Yeah. And immediately felt a lot better. And the cop, of course, they were very nice to you. Right? Yeah, they were. They, they have they have a restaurant there that ha I've been all these places, uh -huh. and they have good birox. Oh, really? At the restaurant. <laughs> well, they go, yes, I know. I eat my way around. Here. Well, the the thing about the cop was he was real nice. Most cops will nice. try to check out uh, <laughs> a stranger coming through town. This guy was checking me out, but he was very friendly. Uh, and they put me in the cop car and took me up to the park. And then that's good. That is good. I'm going to skip over Dan lightly, but I need to talk about Dan because he was a stranger who had good to give the world, and um, that's what he did for you. He gave you good because he took away some of the things you didn't <laughs> need to haul around and redid his pack, and he says, you don't need this, this, and this, and that, and you had books in there, and he said, you can read them and then get rid of them and get another one. That's right. <laughs> Dan was... Uh, Dan was really important in showing me exactly what I needed and what I didn't need. And by the time I got to Manhattan and when I met him, I was so tired from all this stuff in my sack, in my bag, that uh, when he started pulling stuff out, I mean, here's this he complete stranger <laughs> my, my, my looking things. at my stuff and he's pulling them out and he's making a need. But he said, I'm going to show you what you need and don't need. That's right. And... Uh, then he took the rest of the stuff back to Kansas City and returned it to me later. It was really fantastic. Yes. Uh, and my pack was 20 pounds lighter, and, a whole, and the trip became a whole lot easier after I, that. I think I need to ask you, at what point did you begin to change who you were? Did you feel a change coming over you? Uh, and what, what did you feel? Um, when people began to offer their time and their front rooms and their front lawns. I come from the city, so I, I would have first these <laughs> suspicions about what do they want? I mean, what they want to give me this stuff, but they want, must want something in return. Uh, and I had to let that go and, uh, and really just trust that the next step was going to be the good step and, uh, and that it was just going to be one step at a time. And that's a lesson that I've taken into my daily life. Well, and you met uh, Jim in Charlotte, and you said about Jim, you said, I'd met a hundred guys like Jim, people who were obsessed and filled with contradiction and who created their own challenges, and one of them was me. Uh-huh. Yes, <laughs> exactly. Well, and uh, Jim and I, uh, on the outside, were so different, but then I would, I would watch the way he would do his work um, the ways in which he would make... Now you're the one, he's the one you helped do things with. Right. Yeah. Um, I would, uh, and, and the way that he sort of built his own demons. Uh, and I, and I, I found a lot of myself in Jim, even though he and I, in other circumstances, would probably never meet. Never and, meet. Yeah. You met an African-American boy, and I picked him because you did something for him. And he did something for you. Uh -huh. And talk about him a little bit in the baseball game. Um, you'll have to remind me. Well, he was playing baseball, and they didn't want him to play. Oh, this is, uh, um, I think if this is the right, you have to um, jog my memory a little bit. Um, it was, was it in Beatrice, Nebraska? This was a memory that I had. Oh, OK. Uh, I was in a car with a Mormon missionary That's right. who um, turned out to be a, a, just a vehement racist. And it took me back into my own racist past, uh, the kinds of racism that I grew up with. And the kid that you're talking about, the baseball kid, we were playing Cub Scout baseball, and he and I were playing baseball. And under some significant uh, peer pressure, I turned on him. Mm -hmm. And... Uh, and I still think about that. And, and you joined the others joined instead the others. of doing what you knew you should not and do. And I taunted the kid, and I knew that I shouldn't have been doing that. And, uh, and used racist uh, epithets. I never used the N-word, but um, mm -hmm. I might as well have. It was, it's still something that haunts me today. Um, but it's something that I, I learned a great deal from. Well, but that's what that guy reminded me of. 
And that's how yes. racist he yeah. was. And that mob psychology <coughs> and that racist thinking um, isolates people in one and one and one, and they can't defend themselves. Right. They can't. And I think that that's probably why it makes you feel bad all these years later is that that mob psychology is cruel. I gave into it. It's I gave cruel. into it. And, and a lot of people do. Mm -hmm. But you learn something else. I learned, yeah. Yes. I think that um, there was a woman that gave, that tr trusted you, Peg. Peg, yeah. With uh, sh I walked into her convenience store, and uh, she asked what I was doing, and found out that I was traveling, and threw me the keys to her house, and told me to go get myself set up. And um, the kids came home later. Uh, she had kids. She trusted <laughs> me with her kids. Uh, and then we had a nice long discussion after she came home. But that trusting that she she just had a see, and this is something else I had to learn sometimes it's not just me right it's it's not how I feel about people I have to understand that they feel something about me too and that's difficult for me to to admit uh, but there was something about me that she felt she could trust but she said something to you that I thought perhaps uh, resonated she said well she said you kind of make the life you want for yourself. Right, right. That's exactly right. And that's what right. you were doing. Uh-huh. That's exactly right. And maybe she had some sense of that. I don't know. Yes, yeah, she, and she, was in, she had tough circumstances herself. Her husband had left her. She had a couple mm -hmm. of kids. One yeah. had some medical And she issues. said she liked to leave there, but she just couldn't get it together, mm -hmm. to money together. To well, it's it. very difficult sometimes <laughs> in these small towns because uh, Peg was very lucky in that she, she worked. She had a job. In, in, in near where she lived, but I met people across the plains who drove sometimes 60 miles to a job at yeah. minimum wage. So they're eating up Before they three start. or four hours of their work day just getting back and, and forth to work. And they have nothing work. left. Right. They do. Let me ask you this. You met a lot of people different. Was there any particular theme or thread that ran through all of them even though they were very different people? Uh, for the ones who were good people, uh -huh. uh, good to me, uh, they wanted to share in the journey that I was taking. Uh, it's almost as if, they, as if they were living vicariously through me. Uh, the people who were unkind, uh, I felt felt that they were frustrated in their own lives, uh, that they uh, perhaps were in the situation that I found myself in at the beginning of the trip that really prompted me to take the trip. Um, and so I had a, gr uh, even though people were sometimes mean to me, I still had a feeling of understanding for them because I, I understand what it means to be frustrated in life and work. By the way, I saw this is some weeks ago, and it, I didn't connect until I read the book. But there was an ad in the I read everything. I told you that mm -hmm. a, an ad in the paper. Uh, they wanted to sell a restaurant in Cozad, Nebraska, uh -huh. and you were there. Did you see it? Yeah, I I uh, I don't know if I was at that particular restaurant, but the the interesting thing about Cozad is I stopped at a memorial rock on the side of uh, Highway 26, and and. Uh, took my shoes off and this guy pulled up and said, hey, you want to ride into town? Why don't we let us take you around, let us show you around. Uh, I got a tour of the uh, Monroe Shock Factory that just, by the way, closed, taking 700 jobs with it uh, out of Cozad. That just happened this past that's couple tough. of weeks. That's tough. Well, maybe that's why they wanted to sell the restaurant. Uh, yeah, maybe so. Um, probably so. Yeah. But uh, I got a tour of the Monroe Shock Factory. The cops offered to put me up in the jail. <laughs> Um, and and uh, it was really, I, I know more about Cozad, Nebraska than I think well, anybody else I thought else that I might know. be of interest to you. Yeah. I want to I wanna read a paragraph from this book, and it says, I was also an outsider. Having grown up on the edge of the Great Plains, I only had the barest notion of its importance, and the depths of my ignorance were becoming obvious. Mm -hmm. You were beginning to learn a few lessons That's there. right. That's right. In the past, its people and places were always fresh and different to me. My vision had not suffered the fatigue of life and work in what, despite physical expanses, could be close to economic and social quarters. Mm -hmm. These people were of a 
not of the same social strata that most of us bump into mm -hmm. every day. That's right. I was oblivious to the politics of relationships in small towns, the problems associated with small town and rural life. I knew nothing of people's ambitions, thwarted or fulfilled. You were pretty interested in your own bills unpaid and whose fault right. it was right. and all that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Resentments festered here as they did anywhere else. As I discovered how little I knew boundaries between city and country and separating human and nature grew more indistinct and blurred. Would you like to comment on that? Yeah. I thought that was a really I think it's a good it's a good uh, uh, a good theme for today and today's politics is we really believe that there are these huge differences uh, between country and city and in fact the kinds of hardships uh, perhaps even poverty that people suffer in the country are the same things that we suffer in the city. Uh, and, you know, I had this sort of rosy idea of small town life, and it turns out that small towns it's can tough. be kind of nasty sometimes. It's tough. And I think you found that we all share frustrations, we all yes. share hardships, we all have troubles. Those are things. Uh, I became, uh, I was a pretty understanding person to begin with. But uh, because of this trip, I've become more and more. Um, I just have to tell you this. In this book, he talks about uh, taking a bath. And he's talk he says he bathed head to toe with a quart of water using a washcloth and half a bath towel. <laughs> and I thought, uh-uh, I'm not doing that. Well, my, I, every day I wanted to walk out and be clean with clean hair. And so my hair was much shorter, obviously. Um, but. Uh, Really, and I, I, I say in the book, uh, there's at least one person in there who says that uh, uh, it's odd, but you're more likely to help somebody who doesn't look like they need help. Uh, and so that's why every day I, I endeavored to have clean hair and a shave and <laughs> decent clothes on. Uh, because I, I didn't want those things to stand in, the, in, in between me and, and... Would you take that trip again? I would. I would. Yes, I would. I've thought about it many times, as a matter of fact, and I've got a 14-year-old who has read these books, and uh, he wants to take a walk with you me. You said, I looked forward to meeting the next person who, like Francis, Peg, and the Jims, would unselfishly um, reveal my wor world by taking me into his or hers. That's right. That's and right. I, I, I think you will enjoy this book. I would encourage you to, uh, you can order it at uh, Barnes & Noble, and they they print them as they sell them, and they will send it to you. They uh, actually, uh, it's 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 in warehouses, so that bars. Well, they, I had to order. Yeah. It. Oh, okay. And yeah. and so, but they may have it. Mm -hmm. It didn't take it. very long, mm -hmm. and they sent it to me, and you will truly enjoy it. And I I have to say that I have enjoyed more than I can tell you. Um, Patrick Dobson. Well, I have you really came. enjoyed being here, and thanks for having me on. It's and really I think fantastic. I will close with this Walt Whitman's poem as you closed your book. And you said, forever alive, forever forward, stately, solemn, sad, withdrawn, baffled, mad, turbulent, feeble, and dissatisfied, desperate, proud, fond, sick, accepted by men, rejected by men. They go, they go. I know that they go, but I know not where they go but I know they go toward the best, toward something great. And Patrick, you did too. Uh, and you made that trip and you learned a lot about yourself and about the people around you. And I would suggest that you will really enjoy Seldom Seen, A Journey into the Great Plains by Patrick Thompson. Thank you can you. even take his class. If you yes, want you want to. to. That's <laughs> yeah. right. Thanks, Patrick. Thank you. Thanks for having me. I appreciate it. Thank you.